Well, hello there to everyone in Tribe World. It's, um, it's Ray here. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and wherever you are in the world and that you're not too distressed in these difficult and challenging times. Um, I thought it might be an idea um, that with us all, or most of us self-isolating or being in lockdown, that we've got some time on our hands and that it would be a great opportunity to um, to do some podcasts, to um, uh, have some uh, chats with the fans and some other things that will let the Facebook page uh, let you know what's happening, quizzes and, and different bits and bobs. But I'm joined here today by really a legend and, uh, and one of your favorite, the man that brought the true power and chaos to uh, the tribe. And so say a very warm welcome to Danny James. Uh, good morning, Danny. Good morning, Ray. How are you? I'm okay, Danny, and uh, and it's good to good to hear your voice. And you're right now in New Zealand. And how's everything in New Zealand for you? Oh, look, it's uh, it's 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 good. It's good here at the moment. Um, I think uh, naturally there's a, a lot of people that are very very concerned. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't one of them at the moment. And you're in lockdown, you know, there, Danny. The, you're, you're what a week into it. It was a few days ago that. No, we're 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 only two days into, into oh. lockdown here at the moment, so it's all very new. Um, but I think uh, there's uh, along with the the concern here at the moment. There's I think a lot of people uh, that are quite relieved that the uh, that the government has chosen to go into lockdown when we have, uh, and I think there is um, quite a bit of hope that the uh, that the that the time and the process that they've gone into lockdown was fast enough that it, it hopefully will be effective um, without being sort of stuck in this lockdown phase for a, a huge extended period of time. No, that's good. I'm, I'm actually in Australia, as you know, and, um, and I was kind of stranded over here. And, um, you know, I was kind of traveling around and uh, we have a holiday home here. But, um, you know, we came over and just for a couple of weeks and found out that uh, you know, it was impossible to get You'll be back. there for a few weeks more. Yeah, I'm going to be here for a few <laughs> more weeks. And, so, uh, and that's fine, you know. But um, So, Danny, you're up, uh, you, you, you were mentioning you're up in the, in the hills. Um, some of the listeners might, if you could just paint a picture of where you're living now. You're up in Auckland. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Auckland. Um, Auckland is uh, surrounded by a combination of um, ranges and ocean, um, for anyone that's not familiar with Auckland. Um, and we're in the sort of the ranges um, on the on the the outskirts of Auckland, I guess. So uh, we can see um, most of Auckland. You know, we can see the Sky Tower and uh, and a lot of the sort of Upper Harbour and things like that. But we're largely surrounded by a uh, nature nature reserve up here. So it's um it's mostly bush, um, okay. which is which is quite nice. But it's um, I think we're um, we. The idea was to um, hopefully um, build build a new place here, but at the moment we're actually tucked up in a um, 1885 blacksmith's cottage. Wow, um, that's so, so it's uh, it's very old. Um, it's it's a bit squashed. Um, it's definitely um, a step or two above uh, a caravan. Um, and there's uh, you know there's a there's a few. Um, it's it's got a lot of character. You know, and I think at the, at the moment, the kids no. love it. Um, they, they think it's very exciting and, and quite a lot of yeah, fun. Good. Some um, of the listeners might not be aware that the, you, you've got two, two children now, Danny, haven't you? I do, yep, yep, yep. Um, my, my son, he's, um, he will be turning six while we're, while we're in lockdown. Um, and my little girl, uh, she's um, about three and a half now. So it's, uh, yeah, life, life, uh, life moves on. And you're coming into... Um, like like what was some of the northern hemisphere, they're coming into spring, and uh, obviously us yep. down here, we're uh, coming into autumn. So you're keeping yeah. warm. It's not too cold there. The weather, how's the weather there? Um, it's it's actually really pretty good at the moment. The nights and the mornings are, are getting colder. Um, you know, but we've got um you know up in the bush here, we've got a fireplace and um, been collecting a lot of wood over the over the summer period. So you know, we'll be okay. I'm, I'm in, in um, Queensland, which is between uh, Brisbane and the Gold Coast, and and it's a beautiful day. It's uh, subtropical, so 
and you know, I'm sitting yep. in my shorts and uh, with a nice glass, <laughs> of, a nice glass of wine. And Danny, what do you do to keep yourself That's occupied okay. in the day then uh, during this lockdown period? Uh, well, as you can imagine, um, with nobody coming, um, we've got a we've got a fair fair amount of lawn to mow. Um, so uh, I've got I, I do have an old push mower, um, wow. and it takes a lot longer to mow the grass <laughs> than the um, the person that turns up on their giant big ride on jobby that can do it in sort of uh, in an hour and a half or something so that that wipes out a day and that was... <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. And, um... yeah that's right and then we've got um you know obviously uh we do bear hunts with the kids and um i've made some treasure maps so we do lots of treasure hunts um and then um obviously uh things like the trampoline they're um they're a pretty big hit um I've set up a little uh, a chipping practice area, so I can I can my golfing is um, you know keeping me busy as well. Yeah, um, so we've you know lots of um, I think we're lucky enough to have a bit of grass around us um, that we can utilise without sort of going outside the the property limits, um, and that's made it much much easier um, for us to sort of keep the kids busy at least on the sunny days. No, um, space is a bit of a premium on the rainy days inside our little cottage, but um, when the sun's out, it's uh, you know we, we can we can we can keep them all busy, and it's all good. Have you got any tips for any of your listeners uh, what they might do? I mean, in addition to watching the tribe, of course, to get some tips on that. <laughs> I think the uh, the biggest thing would be to you know, especially as as far as um, young people go and kids, if, if people have got kids. Um, the best thing you can possibly do is try and have as much fun as possible because, um, you know, there's, uh, I was thinking about it the other day and I think, um, you know, the stories I had when I was growing up, you'd say, Dad, I'm bored. And, you know, Dad would say, oh, oh, you know, when I was your age, we didn't have PlayStation or anything like that. We all had to, everything we had to do was outside in the sun and all the rest of it. So later on, you know, in, in the future years, when our kids have kids and their kids are saying, Dad, I'm bored, you know, they'll be able, this will be their sort of long walk in the snow moment where they'll be able to say to their kids, you know, you're not bored, you don't know what bored is. We had to spend a whole month in lockdown yeah. during the effort, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice way of looking at it, actually. That, uh, and Danny, that, that um, you and I, we, we go back a long way. And, and uh, yeah. D- Danny referred to me to some of the listeners and, some of our tribal brothers and sisters around the world. Danny had always said, I'm the oldest teenager in town. And um, so I've, kn- right. I've known Danny, for, I'm still the oldest teenager in town. So I think you're older than me now, Dan. Well, I'm, I'm doing my best to, 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 to hold on to that Peter Pan thing as well. As one of the well, great lessons that you taught me as a young man is that it was, well, uh, you know, there was a certain level of maturity required with growing up, but at the same time, that inner child you've got to keep in touch with. Uh, it's very important. And hundred uh, percent, yeah. yeah. And Dan, a lot of the the listeners and um, uh, might be of interest to know a little bit about your background, and I'll just give them a, a quick overview. That I first yeah. met Danny. As a as a boy, really, when you were a very young man and you auditioned, yep. this was way back in probably nineteen ninety four ish, for yep. when we, our very first series, in the Blind Adventure series, and and I was really taken with your uh, being, your spirit, the whole. You, you're a tremendous young man, and I thought very special and and certainly very talented, but above all, a, a good human being, as I as I like to. Uh, um, think of uh, some people who are very special, and and um, and um, um, it was just down. You came right down to the wire on that series, and it was yep. really a, you would have been cast, but it was a question just with the other three members. We um, when we're casting, we try and match looks and heights and colours yep. and all that. Yep. But, but on season two, um, I was oh, sorry, not season two, the second series, the of secret the, the, the series, secret yep. series. Um, when that came about, I, in fact, we'd written the part for you, to be honest. So you started, how old were you when you did the Secret Series, Dan? Oh, 13. 13, yeah. So, uh, from memory, and yeah. And from the Secret yeah. Series, when you were there, I thought, wow, um, you know, we were developing the tribe and writing the tribe. And so um, Zoot was, was kind of, I thought there's nobody better for the the, the part of Zoot than you. And um, 
and uh, but I made a mistake. I have to say, when we wrote you out in in, um, <laughs> in, in, in after, but the irony is, and again to the listeners, I mean, I was mentioning to Dan just before we uh, came on air. Uh, Dan was telling me how much he's enjoyed uh, reading the three tribe novels. He and you enjoying those? Oh games? yeah. Really, really great. Without do, giving any spoilers, a lot of the uh, uh, listeners, uh, the, particularly those who po- possibly haven't read them all, uh, will be intrigued to know how Zoot still features and has become really a mythological, iconic figure. And um, and I've got some questions, Dan, so bear with me. Of course, yeah. Um, see, Alicia Cameron, there's a question from Alicia Cameron on, uh, yep. and said, Danny, why do you think the word of Zoot and power and chaos had so many following him in the tribe? Also, if you're given the opportunity, we do do more seasons of the tribe. Wow. Uh, so, t- yeah, two, two quite different questions in that one. But um, I'll, I'll start with the first one. I think um, that, that I think I found it always difficult to try and work that one out myself. And I think I got a bit of a view of how it resonated with people uh, when we did the, uh, the, the, the European tour for the box set. Um, and I found it amazing um, how the people who uh, were the biggest sort of locos or, or Zoot fans, uh, they all seemed to gravitate towards it um, for a number of different reasons, funnily enough. Um, some of them loved the idea of, of the rebellion. Um, someone, some of them loved the idea of the, the I guess, the sense of freedom that they, that they perceived came with that rebellion. Um, you know, some of them just felt that it sort of really nailed down uh, how a lot of teenagers felt um, and how they wanted to sort of express themselves that was um, may have been different to, to the social norm. So I don't know. I think um, th- there was a lot of different reasons um, that, it, that it worked for a lot of people. Um, but I think... Uh, it was just a really, it was an exciting role to play. I mean, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed um, being the character. So, yeah, I think, um, to be honest, and to sum it up, I think maybe um, I've still got to work out exactly why and how that, that really resonated with people. It is, it's amazing. I mean, it, I, I've often said it that, um, and that's, a, that's an intriguing insight, uh, Dan, that you've, uh, and I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, I think, you know, if we could only bottle it, or it would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's something I, I think yeah. emotionally connected in such a profound way. And as you rightly say, I mean, it's all. I think it's actually rather than dystopian, it's very aspirational and very positive. Yep. With yep. hope, and um, and that 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 um, yeah. you know, it is. It's building a better world. And in in my yep. day, as an ex hippie. You know, I lived it, and it's a, it's a universal, even for young people today, it's all about the future. Yep. And, and you mentioned yep. about the walk in the snow, which is, I, I think, a lovely, a lovely uh, image of the stories. And, and the tribe is yep. really about facing adversity and yep. uh, triumphing over that, digging deep. And the metaphor of sailing, you know, I'm a, I love sailing. It's, it's not the storm you encounter. But it's how you set your sails, and uh, that's uh, and that's what we're probably doing, uh, all of us around the world, and me in Australia, you in Auckland, and all our tribal brothers and sisters, and whether you're in lockdown yet or not, or it's just you know living in the moment and keeping hope, yep. you know, keeping positive, and and with that, Dan, I've got another question here that uh, from Donna Wheat. What advice would you give the world that is in chaos today? I think what we really have to do at this point in time is to, is, as you said before, we, we have to stay positive. Um, we have to rise to the occasion on this one as a, as a species. Um, because, you know, I think some of the things on the news, the, the things that have concerned me the most um, I can understand why people would would panic buy and go to the shops and buy as much food as they can and things like that. Um, but it's really disheartening when you see lines of people at a gun shop. Um, you know, you, it's just this is not the time for that. This is the time for looking out for each other and looking after each other and making sure that we're all okay um, because that's it's that that'll get us through it. 
yeah, um, yeah. people that feel the need to sort of arm themselves in a situation like this is um as that's you know this it's not a zombie apocalypse you know? no, no, there shouldn't no. be people banging down your door you should you know this is a this is a virus that a gun will not fix um no, no, you know no, and no. Uh, so i think um the only advice is to stay positive and you know to support each other um in in whatever way you can and if that's by if that's by ringing your neighbor or um you know, um, or, or 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 texting, um, you know, your friends and family to make sure that they're okay and keeping in contact. You know, making sure that the people that are um, old and at risk don't have to go to the supermarket. You can go and pick something up for them and drop it at their at their gate or their front door for them. Um, you know, it's that that's that's how we're going to get through this. Now, there's an interesting question here from Milo Hewitt, which uh, and when yeah. you answer, I'm not going to hold you. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you in prison if you. Uh, own up but, <laughs> but so my question for danny did you ever keep any memento or costume piece from set after production had finished actually there was one there was one costume piece that i got given um and that was the um that was the it was a singlet it was the the sort of um the red singlet that went underneath all of the other bits um, so it's probably a bit of costume that most people wouldn't even know if they saw it because it's um, it was the the bottom layer, I guess. Now, Danny, it's an interesting. Um, I mean, speaking to you both as Danny and Zoot, and that's a very yeah. um, a nice, loving thing in a civil society where we need to. Uh, I agree with you. We need to. We're all interconnected, and and again, um, I'm a, as some might know of me. I'm a big fan of. Uh, the John Lennon basically with um, uh, yep. you know uh, to give peace a chance and to love and uh, and that. But um, now putting your your zoot hat on, I've got a yep. fabulous question, an interesting one um, from the perspective of zoot, and this is from Phil Evans. Danny, obviously, lots uh, of us are considering starting a gang of marauders <laughs> right now. Have you yep. got any tips on how to start? First of all, you need a good police car, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so well, well, from a from a Zook perspective, um, you know, I think uh, when we when the when the tribe started on that first episode, um, I think for the fans out there that have got aspirations of gangs, um, you have to remember that the first episode of the tribe um, didn't start in the middle of the uh, epidemic. It was you know a number of sort of weeks or months after that. Um, so I think um, now's probably not the time to start your gang. I think uh, you know, you to, now's the now's the time for survival, probably um, probably planning stage, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, you know, there's uh, there'll be there'll be plenty of time for marauding gangs um, if if this if this thing really did go tribal. Um, yeah. So you know, now's probably the time to enjoy your PlayStation and your family while everybody's um, still in good health. Now, another one from Justin Michael. Danny, would you like to see the tribe come back to television in the new series? Oh, <laughs> look, you know, I mean, um, that, that's sort of a, in, a, in part the same as um, the second part of the question before, which I didn't get to about, you know, doing other things. And um, first of all, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. You know, I think uh, for so many reasons, um, the, 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 you know, working... Um, with uh, all of the cast and crew on the tribe was uh, a very, very special privilege for me. Um, and I always, um, I always count myself extremely fortunate to have been with the Cloud9 family. Um, you know, the lessons that I learned um, both on the cast uh, and um, on my time on the crew, um, I've taken with me to every other aspect of life. And I think... Um, you know, it was uh, it was an education that I couldn't repeat or um, uh, or or um, recreate even if I tried. So you know that would that was amazing. I think um, you know many many times, hopefully doing a movie or or, or doing some sort of um, tribe um, resurrection. Uh, and I think um, you know if that if if that opportunity ever arose, I would be I'd, I'd jump at it because you know it was. Um, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you, sometimes you look back on those cloud nine times as, I guess, for lack of a better term, the glory days. We get uh, lots of questions on this, and um, you know, I, I'd love it to happen, and 
and I'm committed to making it happen. I'll, I'll never give up trying to make it happen. And uh, there's two things. I mean, if it ever did happen, I'd obviously, you know, love to work with Danny and the rest of the cast and the crew in a heartbeat because, <clears throat> you know, we have become like a family and, and a tribe and, and we are very close. And, you know, Danny and I, we socialized. We had we were just reminiscing on a, a lovely dinner we had together yeah. a while back in Martinborough in, uh, on the vineyard. And <clears throat> and so, yep. you know, it is, it's very special. And, and it is, I mean, I often say that some of the, cast Danny when you you know living in the house with house parents and uh, it's like going oh, into yeah. the army with schooling and so you know yep. and, and really I mean yeah we all looked out for each other really then didn't we and and we're very close yep. and um and uh and then uh, Dan maybe you might mention after Zoot you then stayed and you went into the art department and and um, and what did you do there? Well, a lot a lot of different things. I mean, um, once uh, once I finished suit, the first thing I um, I went to was um, the uh, uh, the runner in um, in the office, um, and that was uh, sort of an assistant to uh, well, it was you and um, the uh, Jeff Husson um, and a number of the other people in the executive team. And you know, for me as a as a young man to sort of see how the whole Cloud9 business was run um, on, a, on an executive level as opposed to what, what I'd always seen um, on, on site. Um, that, was a, that was a hugely valuable experience. Um, then I went into the uh, art department, um, and again, that was, a, that was a lesson and a perspective on how the day-to-day -day, um, sort of administration of set and um, and the creation of a lot of those props and sets and locations before the crew came and after the crew left. Um, because um, as the art department assistant, quite often you're not actually on set during principal photography. You're there before and after, either setting things up or taking things down. So that was, uh, that was a real experience that um, learned a lot. And then um, moved on to the um, third assistant director. And that, again, was a... Um, uh, you know, watching some of the first ADs and how they operated and the ones that had the greatest respect amongst the other crew members and the ones that were really good at their time management and people management and the management of various different people's expectations and personal characters. Um, you know, the lessons I learned working with those guys was um, it probably, uh, you know, some of the most valuable lessons and 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 management that I took on to my own business. Um, so, you know, the, all of the different roles that I played as, as in my various different time through the Cloud9 family um, were, it was, it was almost like a, a university education, um, you know, application on the ground. <laughs> was... But uh, Dan, you and I, uh, very often in my office, we'd um, have lots yep. of chats on, all kinds of things as uh, matters spiritual to all kinds of stuff really and and um and that was very special as as as, as us teenagers uh, bonded together yep. but dan is it possible uh, 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 and and um and don't worry if it's not i mean can we talk about your mum yeah well that was um so um the very, my mum passed away um while we were filming the tribe um and you know so that was uh that was a really really um sort of tough experience um but in a lot of ways um you know the support that i got um from from you and and the rest of the cloud nine family through that time uh was you know in a, in a large part why it made that time for me uh, um i guess such an informative period um, you know, as a young man trying to sort of go through that grief and loss. How old were you um, at that point, Dan? You would have been uh, 17 maybe? Well, it was right near the uh, near the end of the tribe um, sort of filming period. Mum, mum, mum had cancer. Um, so she was diagnosed with cancer, I think, um, right in the beginning of the first series um, no. while we were filming that. Um, and then she ended up um, passing away just before my 21st birthday. Um, so that that would have you know that would have been sort of near the um, probably the beginning or middle of series five. And we we from your mum was a lovely lady, and um, 
and you and I we used to speak yep. many many times uh, uh, throughout that time period when she was ill and uh, and um, yep. and I was uh, you know taken with your um, uh, spiritually I mean uh, whether people are religious or not but we talked about a lot of uh, a lot about things about life and the meaning of life and and uh, yeah. how some things are greater than I mean it was very profound because we were dealing fictionally with a world with no adults with uh, parents and grandparents yeah. dying and, yeah. and when we're faced with our mortality and um, and it was very very intriguing really and, and profound for me to speak with you Dan and to find you were living with this and uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. with your own mum you know but you you came through it and and your mum still walks with you today and um, and obviously yep. love is uh, transcends death it's greater than anything and um and that's the true meaning of uh, of our being. I mean, and uh, we used to talk about uh, about things like that. But no, I, I just wanted your uh, listeners and your fans to to know that you yourself have no, had some heartbreaks and a, tragedy, but you've come good. You've, it you've is, come through it. Yeah. Well, it's a um, it is it's quite bizarre, and you know we often we get questions about sort of um, or, or people that say, "Hey, well, I was a fan of the tribe and." Um, you know, I was going through, uh, you know, some sort of adversity in their own lives. And, you know, a number of times I've heard people say that the tribe was um, something that really resonated with them um, for so many different reasons. Um, and it's always been quite bizarre that for me, um, being involved in that process, um, having something that I really enjoyed, having something that I was passionate about, um, you know, having, you know, you and Toby and Saran and, um, you know, the other people that were involved in that uh, to talk to and to sort of um, to get support from and bounce ideas off and, and speak about things through that time. Um, you know, for, in a lot of ways, the tribe saved me. Oh, that's so um, very um, So, you know, yeah. it's, it's always, um, it's always, you know, amazing to look back on that. And when people sort of say, oh, look, you know, I've, it, it helped me through whatever time. It's quite funny because I sort of sit there and think, yeah, well, me too. <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, I sadly, during the filming of the series, um, lost my brother, my younger brother. And um, and it's the same type of thing that we, we uh, maybe that unites us and, and it makes it even more special. I mean, I, I'm always saying it the the loyalty and the support of our fan base is, is amazing, really, and it's uh, like nothing else I've ever experienced. That um, I mean, there's one interesting question here from Lisa Brinker. Hi, Lisa. I know Lisa. We've spoken a few. She's been a, 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 a prize winner, so I've just seen your name pop up, and I hope you're doing well, Lisa, out in America and um, yep. coping with this. I know America's um, struggling really hard right now, as we all are, but, uh, but so Lisa's saying, how does it feel that your character who was only in a few episodes was such a key figure in the entire show were you expecting that when you played the part how does it feel to have such a big fan base as zoot well okay so um was i expecting it um absolutely not i remember um when we when we came to wellington to do the screen testing and the um and the, the wardrobe and makeup tests and things like that um, I think it was it was really only at that point um, that I that I realised uh, that that you know we started to to discuss uh, the future of the characters and um, you know where the script was going and and what the tribe was even about because uh, a lot of us uh, you know were excited about the new series but um, you know we didn't we didn't know a whole lot about it so. You know, at that point, I, f I found out that, uh, you know, I'd got this part and I was going to play Zoot and he was the bad guy. But unfortunately, um, he was set to have a have a bit of an ending issue on the, on the eighth episode. <clears throat> so I sort of assumed um, that that was that was going to be that. And um, there wasn't going to be um, a huge amount of involvement after that. So. I to this day I've always been uh, very surprised by um, how it's really resonated with so many people. I mean, uh, again, I've probably uh, um, dealt with the uh, the question in some of the other interviews, but for the, for the, so forgive me for repeating myself to some of yeah. our uh, listeners. But for those who are unaware, I mean, 
Um, during the storyline arc, um, I had always thought that um, Zoot would feature, but it really was organic. And because Zoot, as well as the, the series in general, had kind of connected in such a profound way, um, I think it's fair to say that it took us all by surprise, you know, and, and me especially. <laughs> Um, and even yeah. um, even in the books, you know, where we're still um, Zoot still features very prominently, and um, and it is it is it's quite. A, and I, I actually don't know why, and um, you know, I suspect I just don't know. I mean, it's um, it's it's just, it's just I, I just don't understand it. But it it it, <laughs> it, it happened, and and Danny, there's uh, another question here that you were mentioning about how that formed part of your university and to the wonderful, yep. uh, and, I, and I can vouch for this, that uh, uh, all, y y you know, when I cast people, I cast them not just for their talent, um, mm. but for their, for their being, for their, uh, and I can vouch that this is a, one very special young man here that, uh, that we're, we're, we're discussing and a lovely human being and has become a fabulous husband and dad and, a great role model, you know, and um, yep. and a tremendous young man. And and Jessica Jackson is asking, "Hello, Jessica, hope you're okay." And so Jessica, Hi. Saying, what's he up to these days? So what are you doing these days, Dan? Um, well, I'm, I'm a, uh, I run a building company in in Auckland now. So um, we've been operating for, oh, I think probably almost oh, the better part of fifteen years now. Um, we've got a number of apprentices and, um, clients and things like that. So we do a lot of, um, uh, I guess you could say sort of the more challenging end of, um, renovations, um, or bespoke new builds, um, stuff that's sort of, uh, exciting and challenging to get into. So, uh, these days, the majority of that for me is project management. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, yeah, so for that we um, we're managing the the whole entire site. So the the you know from the clients and working in with the architects and um, dealing with the various different sub trades that are organised in the project and making sure that they're on site and doing things uh, when they need to and um, that the thing is flowing as as quickly and efficiently as possible. Yeah, and I, I know from your um. <clears throat> time in the art department, Dan, and that you're, I mean, it's very creative carpentry and building. And I mean, you, you've yep. always been a, since a young boy, when I first met you, you've always been creative. And, and, um, and even today, I'm sure you would, if I said, look, I'm doing another series, come and play Zoot, you'd, you'd want to do that because it's a need yeah. you have as a creative yep. being. But um, also building your business is very creative. And and you you founded the company, didn't you? You started that and from nothing. Yeah, really. I did. yeah. I started it from nothing. It was um, well, it, was, it started with me and a tool belt. <laughs> so, oh. um, oh. you know, now we've got a quite a good team of guys, and um, you know, they they do amazing stuff. But it's a, uh, I think I've always found it a um, a very tangible uh, job satisfaction, um, being able to create something. Um, you know, have have input on people's design decisions with how their how their home comes together and and how that feels as a space. Um, you know what that looks like and what you know fixtures and fittings go in. Um, it's a uh, you know going home at the end of the day and seeing someone's home that's been created um, and and how that space works for them as an individual or a family. Um, it is it's ma um, it's massively rewarding. I'm and I really, really enjoy it. I mean, it's a, it's an incredible thing, really. I, I, I can't change a light bulb, you know. I mean, I, I wish I could. I'm in <laughs> awe of anybody that can uh, build anything. And um, it's interesting because in our business, I mean, in film and television, we um, it's a very intimate uh, element, you know, where we're invited into yeah. the living rooms or cinemas or above all imaginations yeah. and minds. of, uh, And that's a big responsibility. And... Uh, and that's why yep. we always at Cloud9, our, our theme was always yep. to try and do something with a bit of a message that was positive and aspirational rather than lowest common denominator. I mean, without sanitizing yeah. the world, we can't sanitize the world we inhabit, but to, to try and give it from, uh, from the heart, you know, from, uh, 
uh, so it's not like a process, not making widgets, but building yep. as well is very intimate. It's as you say, I mean, yep. you know, you're living, you describe your cottage. I'm living in a house right now that, uh, and for somebody who ever built this, it's amazing. I mean, you're building something that, that is a living thing. People live in it and it's, it's, yep. it's, it's a uh, very, very, must be very rewarding. And, uh, and, and, and Danny, I mean, a lot of people in this, terrible uh, situation that the world's finding itself in with them um, you know not just the the health but f uh, physical health i mean um, yep. a lot of businesses will suffer and the economy but yeah um, indeed um, yeah i mean how how uh, you, you're okay you're uh, you know you're you're kind of um uh, get, getting through okay you're not going to be I mean, people are losing their jobs or you you're able to keep them on uh, yeah well i think um well at the at the moment obviously being in lockdown uh, nobody's building anything um so you know all the, the the company and all the guys are are at home is i i assume they're playing a lot of playstation we've got some younger apprentices that um you know they'll be in their sort of early 20s um at their flats and whatnot trying to find things to do uh, so, you know, we're talking to them every couple of days to make sure that they're OK. And um, uh, the government here in New Zealand, for anyone that's out of New Zealand, has um, sort of come to the party with a um, like a wage subsidy. And that's been that's been incredibly helpful. Uh, but, you know, New Zealand is a, is a country that is, uh, you know, it's propped up by um, small to medium businesses. Uh, and uh, all of those businesses have operating costs um, that are, you know, above and beyond whatever wages they pay. Uh, so the longer that the country is in lockdown, um, the the more those businesses are going to hurt. And we're, you know, we're in the same boat as everybody else. So I think, um, you know, we we've always um, uh, been, you know, financially responsible uh, as a business. Um, and so the hope is that we've got enough reserves there to, um, you know, to pay, uh, you know, what we have to as far as, um, you know, insurances and holding costs and storage costs and uh, all of those sort of general operating costs that a small business has. Uh, we're lucky in the sense that we don't have a physical commercial space or an office space that now has nobody in it. Um, so, you know, all of the cafes and bars and, and even larger businesses out there that have have those offices that are now empty, um, you know, that's a, it must be a huge burden that I can only imagine. So that's, um, you know, we're lucky we're, we're, we're not in that situation. So, yeah, mm. I think um, we're okay now. Um, and, you know, if, if as a country people play ball and stick to the lockdown and do what they're supposed to do, then hopefully... Um, Hopefully we can get out of lockdown and get back to business um, yeah. sooner rather than later, and we'll be all okay. No, I'm quite sure. I mean, it's uh, we're in for it. it's a little tough time, but um, you know, yeah. as you rightly say, if we do the right things, we'll uh, get through this, and um, and it will yeah. be business as normal and get back to. Now, just a question yeah. from Pin. Another question on our uh, Twitter page from Pin. What was it like yeah. recording the tribe, and what was the costume like? Who was your best friend? on set if you had one i mean so um three, uh, three questions there i mean it was it was an adventure it was surreal um you know it was all of us as cast members were really young um you know to be involved in the whole project was um was a really magical experience um it was it was like going to the fun house every day you know i think um shooting the tribe you know, being being driven around in a in a police car with guys hanging off the sides on rollerblades and jumping out of the middle of the roof and walking down in the front of the front of the police car, you know, all of those are just um, their experiences and memories um, that were you know very very privileged to have, um, which were you know really fun. Um, really different, um, amazing, amazing times. Um, so, you know, what was it like? It was, it was amazing. It was fun. Um, it was uh, awesome. And what um, did you think about your costume, Dan? Did you like your costume? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I remember it being sharp and hot. 
um, you know, there's, uh, there was a, there was a few parts on the costume that were um, that were a little bit prickly. <laughs> um, you know, the uh, the leather bike pants um, they were they were really really hot on the on the hot days. Um, but look, it, it it looked the part. It did. It it was it was a really it was a fantastically perfect costume for the character. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, the um, I remember the. Uh, um, the contact lenses um, that we had for Zoot, you know, I don't, I don't wear contact lenses, never have before. So, um, you know, <clears throat> trying to get used to um, having having these giant things in your eyes that uh, make you virtually blind, um, that was that was a real challenge. But even even that, sometimes when I watch the um, the series and sort of watch the playback of some of the takes. I can see my eyes watering, and I'm doing my best just to keep my eyelids apart um, because I could hardly see, and the and the lenses really hurt. But for some reason, it seemed to work really, really well with the character, and and almost accidentally gives some of those scenes a a, a funny level of authenticity, <laughs> which yeah. was um, which was not intended at all. But you know, I mean, all of those things, these funny little sort of challenges that you go through at the time. Yeah. I remember the day. Um, I mean, it and, seemed like a, I was in my office, and I thought, "Well, I'd like to give a Zoot a bit something a bit different," and and I wanted yeah. that kind of opaque, almost like snake eyes. You know, these deep blue yeah, yeah. eyes. And um, <laughs> so I, I mean, I hadn't realised. I mean, it was it, it was easy for me to say, but poor Dan in the makeup would have these things. Uh, so when I'm saying, "Don't worry, we look after our children," the child cast very well, the young teenagers, yeah. and poor Dan's there. In agony, getting these uh, contact lenses thrust in his <laughs> eyes. Um, Dan, I've got a question from uh, from Instagram now. From Caroline yep. loves to travel. That's interesting. I, I bet you're not doing too much travel right now, Caroline, but um, I, uh, you <laughs> yeah. will soon. So, what is your favourite memory of filming the tribe? That is that is a really hard question, just because there are so many. Um, the tours you you did some tours you enjoyed. Touring, yeah, you? I think <clears throat> so. Funnily enough, um, I mean, I don't know if people really realise the, um, I guess how how things are here in New Zealand as as far as um, I guess sort of celebrity or or anything like that goes. But uh, you know, someone asked before, you know, how is it having such a huge fan base, you know, so long after the trial? Well, the reality is, is that you know we don't really see it. Um, you know, there's uh, there was there was that time where I, we, I, did, I went on the uh, tour for the box set, um, and prior to and ever since that, um, you know, that was really our only real experience of uh, fans physically in front of you. Um, you know, we we get the odd bit of fan mail down here, but other than that, you know, uh, nobody knows uh, who you are or what you've done. You know. Um, I mean, I'd yeah. be surprised if my apprentices knew um, you know, really what it was that I was involved in. I think a lot of them knew that I made a TV series once, but yes. I don't think any of them, um, you know, have ever had any sort of exposure to that. Most of them would have been sort of five years old when it was when it was on. So they, you know, it was not in their sort of lifetime. It's quite remarkable, really. I mean, it's something that. Um... Oh, on that, Dan, it, it, as you say, on the tour, as you, you then see it, it manifests in a physical form. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. You know, when we're out to like 65, 70, 80 countries around the world, it, it's, oh, it's incredible. Yeah. And, and when you get ratings and you find, um, you know, you, 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 when it's millions, of, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre, really. And you, you don't realize well, the responsibility so, in some so, ways you have as well, you know, I mean, to sign autographs. And, and I have to say, all the cast, Dan included, that, and this is why we, you know, we, we used to, um, you know, they, they were tremendous and uh, uh, they'd uh, speak yeah. with the fans, sign autographs, take time, and there was no egos, there was no star, nobody went so called Hollywood, everybody had yeah. their feet uh, firmly on the ground, and, and, and I'm very proud of you, Dan, and all the cast that wore that, really. Well, I think there's, um, I think that level of isolation um, and insulation from, I guess, um, you could say that fame, um, is plays a huge part in that. Um, I, I've, I remember 
uh, one, I guess, incident on the um, tour was when we were in a little place called Erfurt in Germany. And um, we'd turned up to this uh, quite small um, bookstore to do uh, a signing session. And um, Erfurt was um, the only place in that sort of um, area that we were stopping past. And it was packed. We, we sat down at the table at the front and the bookstore was heaving with parents and kids and all this sort of stuff. Um, and this was, um, I guess, the, the bookstore had an older layout with those sort of um, almost triangle bookshelves um, that have all of the book stands and that, all of the things on it. And the people are all crowded behind these um, sort of book stands. And uh, we weren't there for that long before people started um, sort of climbing up the book stands so they could see over the top because some of the kids were shorter than the book stands. And uh, there was only a couple of um, sort of burly German lads there that were doing the, doing the security at the time. And um, pretty quickly, it was almost like something out of a out of the Harry Potter movie. The bookshelf at the back had five or six heads pop up all at once. And then it started to fall over. And as it fell over towards the front, the next group of people started to climb up that bookshelf because they were trying to get away from the bookshelf behind them that was falling over. And the whole thing came towards the state, the crowd and the bookshelves and the whole lot came at us like dominoes. <laughs> and the, the guy that owned the bookshop, he freaked out and he said, well, oh, you got to get out. You got to get out. So the, the, unfortunately the signing just got cut short and they, they were worried their bookshop was going to get overrun and, and, and collapse. So we jumped in the bus outside the bookshop and um, it, the, then it got even more bizarre because we climbed in the bus and the bus took off and we got maybe 50 metres away from the bookshop in this tiny little sort of almost rural type town. And we got to a set of lights. And so we were sitting at the set of lights in the bus and there's no cars, there's, you know, because it's night time. The town was almost ap apocalyptically quiet, it was, it was, you know. And um, all of a sudden almost like a pile of zombies, there was this horde of, of kids outside the bus at the lights, and they're banging on the bus, you know. And so the lights went green, and the bus took off. And like something out of a, out of a comedy movie, we hit the next set of lights so 100 metres away. So we, we just got a little, a, a little distance on this crowd. And then the crowd caught up. So it carried on like this. And we did loops of this tiny little town trying to get, trying to get enough lead on this group of kids um, wow. so we could actually hop out and, and dive into the hotel. And so finally we did that. And it was a, a, you know, an extremely comical sort of experience of, you know, it, you, know you, you start to think, God, I wonder what the Beatles must have felt like. That's right, but buddy. then, you know, a couple of weeks later, the tour was over arrived back in New Zealand, hopped off the plane by myself in Auckland. Um, nobody, you know, there, there's nobody there waiting to see you. There's no, there's no one wants a signature. Everybody's going about their business. Nobody knows who you are. Dad had forgotten what flight I was on. So I stood outside the airport for four hours um, waiting, waiting for a lift home. So you sort of, um, you've got one, one sort of, polar experience and then you come sort of crashing down to earth and you're just another human i mean in new zealand uh, which is a lovely country and very um i mean the kiwi attitude is, is quite different really i mean we um um on the vineyard that that um you know we get a lot of people who are filming in uh, in new zealand very famous people you know who uh, come and want yep. dinner and 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 it's quite interesting because they bring security and we say, look, there's no, you know, kind of uh, paparazzi. Don't worry about it. In this rural community, most people are keen on how many sheep shearing and this kind of thing. And um, <laughs> yeah. and that people yeah. sit there. I mean, and again, I'm not able to say who, but these are very, very powerful A-list kind of yep. people that sit in the restaurant and uh, and nobody bugs them. Nobody, you know, it's a, it's something about the Kiwi psyche as well, and which I think yep. is very special and. Uh, Dan, I'm just looking at, I've got an interesting question from Karina Rocks, I think it is, from uh, on Instagram as well. And yep. and there's two parts. One, possibly I'll need to answer, but because um, uh, if Zoot hadn't died, would he have continued his Parent Chaos philosophy? Uh, on that, Karina, um, you know, the writers, we, 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 we would write 
Uh, in fact, he, he, he has continued through the ensuing seasons and books. But um, there's an interesting thing, Dan, um, with being a father, Zoot being mm -hmm. a father, um, would that, I mean, would that change something in him, even in the smallest measure? I mean, you're now a father. And, you know, what do you think? I mean, if I was a writer saying, hey, Danny, for your character, um, to play this truthfully, do you think Zoot would be a father? Would it have changed his view on the world? Would he have wanted his son to grow up into the world of power and chaos? Or do you think he would have changed or saw some chink? What's your view on that? Oh, um, you know, I think being a parent now, um, you know, there's, there's absolutely no way that going through um, the experience of fatherhood or parenthood um, doesn't change you. Um, it, it changes you profoundly. Um, but I think it changes people in different ways, depending on um, possibly their circumstances as well. So, you know, would it have changed uh, Zoot? I think um, there was that moment um, and, uh, you know, in that last time, you know, in sort of Luke, Zoot's last moments um, where he was handed the baby uh, and, you know, they sort of said, you know, well, you're, you know, this is yours and all the rest of it. Um, and I think, you know, there's no doubt that that would have changed him. Um, you know, whether or not um, Zoot as a character, I guess, was too far down the rabbit hole of a series of decisions. He was a product of... Uh, of a chaotic environment, um, whether or not that would have been enough to, I guess, to make him do a U-turn, or whether or not he would have sort of embraced that, um, you know, that fatherhood and wanted him, um, you know, wanted, you know, wanted something different from his son. I, I don't know. Um, so I guess that was, you know, that's the that 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 comes down to to you, Ray. I guess as the person with the creative license of the character, but yeah, I mean, you know, right. I think. Um, I mean the. the, the... You know, again, I mean, I, I, I love writing and uh, Harry and all the writing team, but I mean, doing the storylines, um, you know, I loved all the characters, obviously, and, and AJ Penn and the books have, has, I think, done a tremendous job um, giving kind of a, a, a what happened next, so to speak, and how it all evolves and unfolds. But I mean, Zuta, yeah. I think, is an interesting, you know, because, you know, out of that, I mean, there's a rebellion, as you rightly said, Dan. And that young yep. people who get sick and tired of the previous generations think the adults screwed up. And, and I can yep. understand in some ways, you know, um, you know, out of chaos, you know, comes a, a new world order. And it's interesting. I mean, that precipitated yep. the Guardian and um, all kinds of things, there's spirituality and, you know, where um, Zoo Thomas becomes a god, you know, kind of, uh, yep. um, and, and a divine figure. And, um, so it's interesting. I mean, it's uh, so, but equally, um, you believe in humanity, and I think you actually played it very well, Dan. I remember when I saw the scene, I I was very touched and moved that there's a moment where uh, in episode eight where he's uh, holding the baby, and you just your expressions in that moment, you can see the yep. humanity, and and as you say, I I, I think that being a parent is um, is quite. Uh, quite something and, and and you do change and you can change and uh, uh but yeah. equally you know it, it is that kind of zealot that fanaticism is is inherent in some ways with it within us all and uh and that's all part of the pain of living i guess that uh yeah dan there's a and, and i can't say the name of you so forgive me it's ulisa i think from instagram um, yep. Now that we're, well, while you were from Lomla Zoot, do you think there was any other character you would have done just as well in? Would you have liked to have played another part? And don't say Ebony or or, uh, <laughs> or uh, um, any of the male yep. characters you would have liked to have played, Dan. Um, you know, funnily enough, I, I think um, I think Lex would have been, a, you know, just a, a really great um, character to play. Um, you know, and I think. Uh, you know that was a that was a character as well that had a lot of a lot of different sides. I think um, you know he was trying to uh, he he was trying to achieve things in, in in his own sort of way, and sometimes that backfired on him, and sometimes it worked. And 
Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, he was in a lot of ways a polarizing and colorful character. Um, you know, so I think um, you know that one. That one I always sort of stood out to me as a character that would have been, uh, you know, fun, challenging, um, and you know, a, a sort of a, a good experience. Yeah, that's interesting. That, you know, from a from a creative point of view, interesting perspective on it. Now, from from the same uh, from you, Lisa. Again, forgive me for not mispronouncing your name, but um, do you still? Uh, sorry, what are some of your current hobbies, if any? <laughs> current you hobbies. You mentioned golf. Um, do you have any other? You used well, to like I, opera, I, I, didn't I, you, Dan? You used to like opera when you were young because your mum used to sing, and you were in the uh, in some productions yep, yep. in the theatre. Yeah, yeah, I did a I did a bunch of them. Um, I haven't been involved in much of that um, for 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 a while, unfortunately. Um, as far as um, my my business goes, it makes it very very difficult to be involved in um, in a lot of those things. But sort of, um, I've got quite a lot of commitments to um, clients and my staff to make sure that um, there's a continuity of work there, which makes that sort of thing um, quite quite challenging. Um, but you know, I still get along to see to see um, you know the performances that are, are done in town when I can, and that's awesome. But I think um, yeah, these days uh, hobbies are sort of um, yeah, I've become um, golf has become um, quite a um, quite almost an addiction for me. <laughs> like, are you good at it, Dan? Do, do you shoot well? Are you are you uh, you don't? What's your handicap if you know? I mean, uh, my handicap's twenty. Wow. Um, so that's uh, it's not amazing. I haven't been playing for very long, um, yeah. but it's um, it's uh, it's something. It's a sport where um, you can play with people who are really really good, um, and with the handicap system, um, that can still be competitive. You know, because ultimately, when you play any given game, um, it's it's not really about who you're playing against. It's you're only ever really playing against yourself. And yeah. if you can have a good day and and shoot a good score um, in comparison to your handicap or your skill level, uh, then you're going to be competitive against whoever you're playing um, in that situation. And so it's um, next time in Montreux, we'll have to have a game, Dan. And I think uh, sounds fantastic. I think you're going to beat me because I'm awful. I love it, but I'm terrible. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been doing it for about fifty years plus uh, VAT and GST, and I still can't. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're 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 a, a world champion. If you're handicapped twenty, you make me look. Uh, you know, I just can't uh, just can't get the swing of it. But uh, yeah. so Dan, we're yeah. um we're coming up to our uh, our hour here. So I'll uh, I'm, I'm to to some of the uh, those around uh, tribe world. I'm sorry I couldn't get all the questions in, but we'll we'll do it again. And uh, and I just wanted to uh, take the time, Dan, to thank you for taking the time to. Uh, to join us, and I'm sure um, that our tribal brothers and sisters around the world will uh, uh, really be uh, would have appreciated you having a chance to chat with them and having an insight more on Zoot and Danny James and and um, and uh, you know if there's anything else you'd like to say in a closing thing to uh, to everybody. Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, thank you. It was uh, it was great to have a chat and a catch up, and um, you know I think. To, to everybody out there, I think I've said it before, but you know, look after yourselves, um, stay safe, look after your family, uh, yeah, and and be kind to each other and be compassionate. Um, I think, you know, the the more the more we look after each other um, during these hard times, the sooner we'll all get through it. That's good advice, Dan. Well, thank you, and um, and to all in Tribe World, till the next time, you, as we say, you keep the dream alive and look after yourself. And take uh, care. I will do, Ray, and you too. All the best, mate, and we'll invite to everybody in Fireball until the next time. <laughs>